Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, ladies and gentlemen, uh, delegates of Horasis Global Meeting, and uh, Dr. Frank Richter, chairman of Horasis. Uh, we are starting our morning session on the Central European time, dedicated to the Greater Caspian region. And uh, traditionally, I would like to uh, clarify that we are talking here about the Greater Caspian region, and uh, which is a big region with a 5 million square kilometers and 500 million people, uh, which consists of uh, Caspian Sea, Central Caspian Sea countries, Black Sea countries, and Central Asia, including Afghanistan and north of Pakistan. And uh, <coughs> I would like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, they had and uh, having extensive experience working with the Greater Caspian Region. And I am Murat Sietnipesov, President of the Greater Caspian Association and the Chairman of the Organizing Committee of Caspian Week in Davos. Uh, I'm originally from Turkmenistan, uh, from the middle of the Greater Caspian Region, but uh, I'm living and working in Switzerland for more than a decade already. Uh, first, I would like uh, to welcome a speaker from Afghanistan, uh, Sham Bhatia, former senior minister and senior advisor for economic affairs for the president of Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, for all of us, and uh, especially for the greater Caspian region, uh, Afghanistan situation is uh, extremely important. Uh, and uh, Afghanistan has borders with many countries of the region, like Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And all these countries are significantly dependent on the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, we all hope for the positive developments uh, for the future in Afghanistan. And also Afghanistan is a very important transit country uh, for the trade between Central Asia and South Asia, East Asia and Africa. And uh, uh, in the frame uh, and the consequences of the war started between Russia and Ukraine, uh, we think that Afghanistan could really uh, be one of the transit routes. Uh, right now, only uh random transports are going on through afghanistan uh, but we believe there is a great potential <coughs> and i would like to ask uh, ambassador batia to share his views on the changes happened uh, during the year past after the last harassis global meeting in june 2021 and uh, our world has changed a lot uh, during this very short period of time uh, and i would like uh, him to concentrate on afghanistan but also on the global situation and uh, which challenges and which opportunities uh, these changes could bring uh, for the greater Caspian region? Please, Sham, floor is oh, yours. Okay. Well, good morning to all of you, uh, to the Horasis community, and Murat, to you, and uh, Frank uh, Richter, to you as well. I hope all is uh, well and all is going okay. Murat, thank you very much for organizing this Caspian region for gathering. Since past number of years, I have been participating in it, and I really, not only I enjoy it, but I also think it's very important that you have taken such an initiative. Bravo for you. Thank you, Sam. With the perspective, the questions you ask about Afghanistan, all the whole region of the Caspian, <clears throat> there are a number of changes have come since past we met in, um, in the Horasis. It's not only in Afghanistan, which has, you saw, since past August, a massive amount of changes, but you also saw changes in Pakistan, which also affects Caspian. You also saw some other regions, which is happening and so on. So I will just add a few things, first of all, uh, in Afghanistan to start with, so they will give the whole perspective to it. Much has happened since August. Afghanistan has become a vacuum country, I'd rather call it at this hour. Uh, nobody has recognized the current regime yet. Uh, even though Talibans are trying their best to say here all kind of things. But still, there is nothing formal political uh, recognition yet. Uh, of course, the, the differences are quite serious in, in this regard. It's more on the value side, it's more on the political side and so on, uh, which Talibans have taken certain positions, which people are a bit surprised why they are sticking to it even in the current 20th 2021st century, basically. But that's the way the whole mentality is and is going on. How long will survive? It's a question. And who is going to get support from? For the time being, there's no support from any particular group or countries uh, for this whole ideology. 
even though the the the, the countries which normally traditionally Muslim countries, um, they are not even recognizing them. So so there is some serious issue here which is going on. Uh, Taliban's are facing it. Uh, the country's situation is very dire. You could, you, we all read in the newspapers and so on. Human rights situation is to the bottom of it, as you, as you call it. Just last week, they abolished the Human Rights Commission, which when I was there, and it was okay. It was doing its best job. And I know the, own, the, the, the heads of the human rights group, but all of a sudden, they abolished it. He said, there's no need for it. Well, <laughs> one cannot say that this is the right decision because human rights is, 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 is something which one has to be respectful to it. So that is something basically changes is coming within the institution structure of the country itself. So that's not a positive thing. Economic wise, it's in a bad shape. One can already see it. They are claiming that, you know, we own uh, reserve in IMF in, uh, in, in, in the US and they are blocking it. But I... <laughs> I need not to say at this hour, but I have been part of that discussions in IMF. Yes, we do have reserves, but that reserves are in a different context, not just to hand over to you, say, okay, do what you want to do with it. You cannot. So that is also a question that one has to address it. But they are counting a lot and they're criticizing a lot because there's not many points that they want to score on. So that is one area that, that they are doing it. The... There's a lot of resistance movements and, you know, uh, discussions are going on between this group and that group, but nothing has materialized. Um, at earlier stages, if you recall uh, uh, this Masood's son, he's, he, Masood was the for, former uh, <clears throat> Afghan resistant uh, person. His son is now taking over, basically. Um, he tried his, his best in, in his capacity, but somehow that did, didn't materialize, but still, still there are movements are going on in the background for the resistance, not only in the northern part, it's in part of the Uzbek, for example, which is another big community in, in Afghanistan. So much is happening in the background, but nothing concrete has come out. Uh, so people are criticizing, people are getting together and so on. My colleagues, uh, former ambassadors, former ministers, they are very upset naturally what is happening and uh, we are always in communication with each other uh, but nothing concrete has come out yet because nobody has found the path to, to, to which way to go through so this is the country's political situation but economics wise it's the worst it's uh, the country which basically was doing very, not very well but continue given the country situation was okay but now that that has affected very seriously. Um, I sometimes, as a former sort of you know person who's looking after the economic issues, sometimes I'm a bit surprised how come the dollar Afghani rate is holding on, which normally should have gone all the way to the bottom, but it's still there. Maybe maybe hmm. many people are thinking they are reserved, or maybe the Afghans who are abroad sending quite a bit of remittances. So that may be also um, one way that the country is keeping up until now the economic part. So the country is, 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 is going through an enormous amount of difficulty. Uh, and I think it will continue to do so if the current regime continues. That is it's not going to change in tomorrow morning. But eventually something is happening. They have to, you cannot ignore. A country exists, it's there. But the regime is changing. So that's a serious issue. Taliban's basically what I have heard, seen, read, and talked is, is they're doing their best, but what do you call their best? So this is another thing. For example, most of the embassies uh, of the country is still there. In almost in all those countries, we have embassies. And the former ambassadors are still functioning as an ambassadors. And they're doing right and left things, which is really uncoordinated in many ways. When you, when you think of it, do you think they will, they, they're going to take the, the, the instructions from the foreign minister? No, not really. But they're doing it the way they're doing it. But the country exists and the embassy, embassy do exist and it is functioning. Uh, so that is something is happening. <laughs> the transit part, yes, Afghanistan has been always the centerpiece of the, uh, of the region and was a transit hub, basically, I'd rather call it. But it's not functioning the way it should be functioning because... 
although the roads are there, the connecting, uh, the, we have even established the railroad. I was at the opening ceremony, which I opened it, um, our railroad from the north to, to the Mazar Sharif area, uh, to, 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 to the Tajikistan and Uzbekistan area. However, it's, it's not functioning the way it should be functioning. It's underutilized, whatever way you can consider, this is the way it, the, the transit hub is. But nevertheless, there's a still need and potential is still there. And uh, it's not only for Afghanistan, but the region, our next door neighbor, Pakistan, which desperately need to have access to not necessarily Central Asia, but go even beyond that, all the Caspian region, continue to Europe and so on. Now, they cannot do anyway. Normally, one would wonder that they should be in good position to negotiate with Taliban. But I question that part as well, whether they are still in, in the position to dictate anything. Because the Taliban have some very specific ideas uh, how to run their own group or country and so on. So Pakistan, in a way, although they helped quite a bit, Afghanistan, um, is a little bit stuck in many ways the way I see it also. So that is also another challenge which maybe not directly affecting Caspian, but one way or the other. Because Afghanistan, whatever happened, as I said the last time, whatever happens in Caspian, it, it affects the whole region. And Afghanistan is one of them, Pakistan, and so on. So we are affected one way or the other. The other new development which is happening also <clears throat> is the changes in Pakistan. As we all know, that Imran Khan's regime was for the first time, for the first time in the history of Pakistan, um, the government was removed uh, to the parliamentarian you know, democracy. What happens in the background? One has to take it at the face value that this was a democratic move. They did what they did. Why they did so? Naturally, there was some difference of opinions. Uh, many people, many Pakistani senior colleagues of mine that I've spoken to, some of them supported, some of them not supported. But one of the key issues was that is Imran Khan basically um, did host two important summits of the, of the Organization of Islamic Countries, OIC. And now this usually doesn't happen like in, in a, such a short notice, but it did happen. So Imran Khan took full credit of it. Now he was thinking beyond something um, to, to go on it. Uh, one of the issue was creation of the, of course, it's not part of the Islamic uh, Council, Islamic meeting. It was like his, creating Islamic force. Whether this is the right thing to do in this today's world to create Islamic force or none, that was also another question. So that was one of the issues that somehow there's quite a bit internal difficulties within the Pakistan as well as in the region wise and so on. So that is something happened uh, within that context. In between, <clears throat> the rivalry between Pakistan and India is also known to everybody at the global level, what, what they are going through it and so on. But what is happening is in the, in the case of India, India is also realizing what I read between the lines and studies and speaking to colleagues and so on. They are also more or less expanding in, 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 in their own political uh, sort of arena because they're also thinking that security is important to them. In Afghanistan, of course, they were very close friend and <clears throat> somehow in Afghanistan, India was trusted. But this change of regime, they don't agree with Taliban. Uh, but at the same time, they're stuck. India had invested heavily in, in, in Afghanistan. It's for over two, 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 two and a half billion dollars, uh, dams and all kind of things. So it's a soft power, but yet they are a bit now cautious not to affect anything beyond what, what it is. If, for example, last uh, few months back, uh, uh, traditionally India was contributing to Afghanistan's wheat um, needs. Uh, for example, even last uh, few months back, they gave 50,000 tons of wheat. Um, the only condition was, okay, here it is, I give you to the border and then you pick up from here. You attract your logistic arrangements and so on. Normally, for Afghanistan, the cheapest way is to bring it to the Waga border in Pakistan, which is just within one day it will be in um, in, in Kabul, for our <coughs> Afghan soil. But the, the difficulty between the two countries has blocked that route 
to to Afghanistan. But but luckily Pakistan agreed this time and they allowed to 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 continue this 50,000 tons. So that is something positive happens. India, the way I see it, is moving quite heavily on many fronts. Uh, however, in Afghanistan, they have become very cautious because of our neighbor and their differences with uh, Pakistan and so on. But they will continue to play a very important role in Afghan politics. In the background, I do notice, speaking to people here and there, Talibans have now realized <clears throat> that you cannot ignore India. This is it's a regional power um, and then continue to be and has been contributing significantly to Afghan economy and the whole geopolitical system of Afghanistan. So they would not um, uh, challenge negatively in that way. So they are keeping very quiet. That quietness itself means that something moving in the background. So that is, uh, I consider positive for the region. So let's assume this will happen. India's role is important also as far as the Caspian region is concerned. Because mind you, it's a it's an over billion population with a vast amount of technical know-how in almost every single field. Uh, they could really help uh, many countries in the region, including Caspian, to provide the technical uh, programs, technical assistance, involvement, Investments, of course, nowadays India is doing very well. If they can buy the Jaguar in, in UK, they certainly like to invest in, in Turkmenistan and, uh, you know, and then many other places as well. So that is another power which is moving off India. And the particularly professional power, which is also India's high tech. Uh, uh, I, I saw very closely the, 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 the vaccination production which happened. And India is providing to basic de- all, mostly all the developing countries. So, <clears throat> um, just following up with the WTO discussions on this MC12, which is going to be held soon, um, there's a question on the on the India's position that they changed now. They blocked the wheat. Of course, they have their own reason, whatever the reason they had. But they were pushed to a point that they made a statement that said, "No, no, no, we are not uh, doing." Uh, the same thing for the developing for those countries which are needed particularly LDCs they call it least developed countries and so on so India will continue to provide those kind of uh, wheat assistance uh, through those which is required and the vaccination part but the role of India in the region is coming more and more visible now that the next next week I think or the following week <clears throat> the meeting is going to be held between Australia, India, Japan and so on uh, so that is also something new which is coming out. Um, such it changes the whole geopolitical, you know, uh, sphere of it. So that is <clears throat> India, Afghanistan. But of course, something else is happening also. Iran. Iran traditionally, what I have known is, is, is a country which has significant influence in the region, not necessarily from the current cultural side of it, but more economic side of it. Iran is a it's a very big country, big economy. Uh, and now even U.S. is more or less de facto getting, you know, asking right and left politely to say you can lift up the embargo and the oil and all kind of things and so on because there's a need for it. The, the Ukrainian war has created a massive amount of problems for almost not only for, <laughs> for Europe and so on, but basically worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. So, Iran can play a crucial role by producing more oil and giving access to it and so on like that. But that, that will bring now another changes to uh, the way I see it, if not today, in, in, the, in the years to come uh, between the whole Caspian region and, of course, at the global level. So let us assume it will be a positive thing and it will continue on that part. I also like to touch upon Turkish role. <clears throat> Turkey has been a prominent power in the region and continue to be. Uh, they have gone to Africa. They have gone to almost everywhere. Uh, whether President Erdogan's uh, Islamic party is successful or not, but at least they are making their presence known, not only within the region itself, but also more or less within the NATO within the whole European context and so on. Uh, of course, they have their own differences of uh, opinions with the 
uh, with the U.S. basically because they are blocking this F-15 sale to Turkey and which they have paid for it and all kind of things are happening that way. Nevertheless, uh, but their blocking of Finland and the Swedish um, vote. Okay, although my personal view is it, it's a temporary, it's a bargaining chip somehow. Nevertheless, Erdogan will not say um, in front of uh, NATO to say, sorry, you can't do that. Uh, because then the next option would be for the NATO countries also to really think on the second part, what to do with the Turkey. Uh, because uh, if you can change this, they can also do what changes they 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 need necessary and so on. Uh, and my feeling is that uh, the Finnish and the Swedish prime minister's visit to Washington uh, and meeting President Biden, I think that will a little bit soften up a little bit, I think, the whole situation in Turkey and so on. So Turkey's role is also very important. It's not only today in Caspian, which is it certainly is is, 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 is 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 has been and continue to be part of the of the of the of the whole region. Turkish has commanded very big respect in the region and continue to do so. Uh, but there is also something else is happening within the uh, within that part. Uh, of course, within the Islamic world, Saudi Arabia is the um, protector of Islam, as they call it, and so on. And they're the leader. But Turkish, although they're not challenging openly, but somehow in the background is also coming up very closely. Um, that the, the Turks has been, uh, being a Sunni country itself, uh, well, the issues are coming up in the background. Uh, messages are there. So whether these messages will continue further to be developed and implemented, that's we have to see it in the long run. So all in all, uh, Caspian region is a, a, an area which basically affected by all kinds of happenings within the region, within the countries itself, which has a bordering with it, as well as uh, um, the future trade and in, in economic relations and so on. Uh, my, my gut feeling is that things will stabilize at some point uh, once this... this uh, uh, Ukrainian issue is a bit solved or a bit addressed in a proper way, uh, whatever way finally you'll come out of it. But nevertheless, it will affect quite a bit. Uh, naturally, in between, the COVID has affected everybody, so we shall see how that will play out and so on. So I'll stop mm -hmm. here and I'll continue to be adding back and forth things. Uh, thank you, Sham, for the extensive and detailed overview of the situation in Afghanistan and in the whole Greater Caspian region. Uh, I just have one short question. Uh, we saw in the news that there are a lot of discussions recently happened uh, <coughs> with regards to the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline. And uh, there is a certain optimism and uh, there are certain assurances from uh, Taliban that they will pro uh, arrange security uh, and safety for everything for this pipeline. Uh, what do you think about the immediate perspectives of this project? Thank you, Murat. This is uh, this, this pipeline project has been on the front line since I remember since all these years, basically. Uh, it's a very important project. It has to. It, it will serve many countries within the region itself. First, Afghanistan, because after all, it's a transit country, and this will economically benefit because of the transit fees and and those type of uh, income and so on. And then Pakistan and continue even further to India and then so on. So that will continue to be. Uh, of course, our biggest issue, which I remember in, in, in various meetings in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan that I had with colleagues over there, and this issue was the security of the pipelines. How, who's going to guarantee this? Of course, earlier days, whatever the Afghan government says, yes, you can, but end of the day, they decided not to, whatever the issue was. But now if Taliban says, and they are controlling, I won't say 100%, but let's say 90% of the country, um, but at least there's established government, whatever government that is, uh, if they say that they can guarantee that, this will be done. And that is a positive, I take it positive from that point of view, that something positive can happen if, 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 if they say guaranteed. Uh, that will have that has a much larger effect on the country and the region too, definitely. Thank you, Sam. 
on this optimistic uh, statement, I think uh, uh, we have a big hope that the situation in Afghanistan will be improved very soon uh, on all aspects. And then uh, all these great projects could be possible to materialize, starting from the TAPI pipeline, also transit through Afghanistan, which will be now very important for the region and for the whole world. Okay, now uh, thank you again, Sham, uh, for your contribution uh, to the session. Now I would like to invite uh, Matthew Breiser uh, to join uh, and uh, to share his views. Uh, Matthew, he is a former United States ambassador to Azerbaijan and former director for Europe and Eurasia of National Security Council of United States. Uh, former deputy assistant of Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia. And he was coordinating er energy policy for the region, which we are calling now Great Caspian Region. And uh, uh, it is very important uh, to hear what uh, Matthew thinks about uh, the situation with the transit corridors between the Great Caspian Region and the world, and particularly for the Europe. And uh, also in the frame of the uh, European energy security. Please, Matthew. Uh, thanks, dear friend Murat. And, and I could have uh, happily listened to Sham for a few hours. That was one of the absolutely most interesting presentations I've heard in a long time. I learned so much uh, in those few minutes, uh, not just knowledge, but, uh, you know, wisdom and insights. Um, and as I, you know, as I was reflecting or as I reflect right now, <laughs> what I just heard in the context of your question, uh, Murat, um, you know, I sense that, again, and looking back to our last Harassus uh, general meeting, um, the, the amount of change is incredible, especially, of course, for Afghanistanis, uh, but also in terms of what corridors are embraced or are possible in terms of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but then what, what Sean was just saying about how if the Taliban says it's going to provide security for these uh, pipelines and transit routes, then, then we can take them at their word. So there, there's so much swirling around, yet... If Murat, if we look at what you and I, for you know, a long time, have focused on these transit routes, um, a lot of it is stalled, and and so we're at a moment where there's, I think, an enormous amount of <coughs> breakthrough in terms of these uh, uh, Greater Caspian region to Europe transit routes, but but we're kind of on hold uh, for a moment. So let me expand a little bit. Now, my, my, my yeah, what brought me to the region was back in 1998 when. Uh, then President uh, Bill Clinton decided to form a very small team, there were uh, three of us, <laughs> to coordinate uh, our U.S. government efforts uh, in, to assist uh, basically the countries of the Caspian region, uh, mostly Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan, uh, to work with Turkey, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, and then the, the companies, private companies like BP, but state companies like TPAO and SOCAR, uh, to build a network of oil and gas pipelines linking the Caspian Sea uh, to Europe via Turkey. So as Sean was saying, Turkey has a, a very, very important role in the greater Caspian region. And from the perspective of U.S. Uh, strategy, uh, it, it has since we got interested in the region. I mean, it was the, the, the prospect of exporting uh, the largest discovery of oil and gas in the world for 20 plus years. That was in, in Azerbaijan back in the 90s. Uh, to global markets that got the U.S. first really focused on the greater Caspian region, for better or for worse. Uh, and, and the U.S. was interested, not because it planned to control those resources, because we knew that we were never going to be, able, be consuming them. We were never going to consume the natural gas coming out of the Caspian region. And the oil, okay, you know, the oil is fungible. It's traded as one of the most liquid, no pun intended, liquid global commodities that there is. Uh, so, yes, you, some U.S. companies would be peripherally involved, but um, for us, the greater Caspian region was important because as the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we knew Russia wanted to monopolize the export routes. And we wanted to make sure that the countries of the greater Caspian region that are former Soviet socialist republics had a chance to choose their own futures, choose their own destinies, choose to be either part of the transatlantic community via the OSCE and other arrangements and or stick with Russia as long as they were making that that independent choice. So that's that's for me the context for how the United States is dealing with Ukraine and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, the goal of the United States and, and the rest of NATO is not to pull Ukraine into NATO. It's to give Ukraine an option. If it wishes to join NATO, great. If it wishes to remain neutral, no problem. And same for the countries of the Caspian region. So uh, right after September 11th, 2001, now, 
when I was working at the White House, in fact, I was inside the White House at the time we thought a plane and there was a plane coming at us uh, immediately afterward, um, the greater Caspian region and, and 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 the Caspian itself became absolutely the focal point of how the U.S. would respond uh, the, the day after. So September 12, 2001, then President of Azerbaijan, Haider Ali, have reached out uh, to, to, to us and said, we are with you till the end. Our airspace, our maritime domain, our land corridors, we are with you because we, we have an idea of what you're going to do. <laughs> and they've been reliable all the way through, though negotiations sometimes got a little bit tricky <laughs> on commercial grounds. Uh, but Azerbaijan stuck with us. So at that point, we were thinking, hmm, maybe maybe we want to encourage the, the, the five former uh, uh, Soviet Socialist Republics of Central Asia uh, to move toward the transatlantic community. And after after a couple of months, I'll never forget that my, my boss at the time, National Security Advisor, uh, Condoleezza Rice, she said, you know, that doesn't make sense. The countries of Central Asia are Asian. They're Asian first. They're not Euro-Atlantic. They're Asian. So let's help them prosper. Let's help them develop the, the uh, transit ties in whatever direction they need. Yes, so, some of the transit will be through Russia. So hopefully some will be westward across the Caspian into Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and onward. But some should be to the south as well, to the Indian Ocean. Um, so I thought that was a moment of, of enlightenment for us. Uh, and I think those attitudes now have pervaded all the subsequent years. Um, for the Biden administration, however, the, the debacle of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan has been extremely painful and embarrassing uh, and humiliating. One of the worst own goals the U.S. has ever scored in foreign policy, certainly since the invasion of Iraq. Uh, so um, I think that that experience, that horrible experience, and, you know, constantly, I think the Biden administration is haunted by the humanitarian, not to mention strategic consequences uh, for Afghanistan itself and for the U.S. That experience now uh, really awakened in the Biden administration a need to, to move in the direction it was already going with regard to Ukraine, which is to play a decisive role to make sure uh, we lay the foundation for Ukraine to choose its own future, choose its own destiny uh, and, and, and to offer the support that is that is decisive. OK. So what does that mean then for the Caspian region? Um, A, it means obviously transit routes through Russia are off the table for, for Europe. Um, the last time we met, we were talking about these four major options for transit uh, involving the greater Caspian re region you know, across Russia, uh, China's Belt and Road, and, and China and Russia were both kind of coordinating, but also competing on transit from the Far East, from the Pacific Ocean westward. Now, Russia is going to be largely shut out for, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but again, looking from the perspective of Washington, even though I'm sitting here in beautiful Istanbul, from the perspective of Washington, uh, leaving Central Asia to, to Chinese dominance through uh, uh, arrangements of, of dependence via the Belt and Road Initiative through mass, massive investments that lead to a situation where the countries often can't repay uh, the loans and then those, the assets that were developed uh, fall into China's hands. That That's not appealing in Washington either. Um, doing whatever we can to stabilize <clears throat> Afghanistan. I mean, that's that's what we've tried to do for years. That's that's a, kind of a black mark on, on, on U.S. record right now. So, uh, I, you know, the, the U.S. isn't going to be able to gain, I think, a lot of traction in Afghanistan. I think the region, therefore, is is largely going to be on its own with, with help from the rest of the world. Uh, but then there's Iran. And as Sean was saying, there's there's a new interest in the Biden administration in opening up transit routes through Iran, at least not opposing them because of the Biden administration's desire to return to the JCPOA. Uh, so in terms of transit routes, I think we could argue that the cross Caspian routes are more important than ever for Washington uh, and for our European allies. Uh, but so is the possibility of, of transit across Iran. And when we talk about the transit options, I think oil and gas are still at the top of the agenda and really natural gas right now uh, because of Europe's uh, goal of reducing its dependence uh, by, uh, I guess, one third this year on Russian natural gas and then and then weaning itself entirely uh, within the next few years from Russian natural gas. Well, there's not a lot of available natural gas out there right now in the market. Um, there's enormous potential. Uh, I would argue that the vast majority of natural gas reserves in the world that have been discovered, and especially in Turkmenistan, are never going to get developed because it's just going to be too expensive to build the infrastructure in many cases. Uh, and 
Europe and the United States are trying to move away from natural gas. Uh, and, and the global energy transition focuses on getting the world to produce electricity via renewables and eventually hydrogen. And then one day, God willing, inshallah, there'll be fusion. Uh, and there have been big breakthroughs in fusion over the course of the last several months. But getting it to be commercial is still a ways off. But once we have it, we'll have unlimited uh, energy with zero carbon emissions. In the meantime, though, we have a transition to make. Now, with Europe uh, trying to cut off uh, its, its intake of Russian natural gas, bringing gas from the ga greater Caspian region to Europe is urgent. It's an urgent goal. Yes, there's a lot of liquid natural gas out there and in, 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 in growing volumes, but most of it is already allocated to pay off the investments in the liquefaction facilities. So um, Europe is scrambling to find more supplies of natural gas and, and its eyes are on the Caspian. And so this gets back to the transit across Iran. Uh, Turkmenistan has excess supplies of natural gas. Russia and Iran continue to oppose and will forever continue to oppose pipelines across the Caspian. Hopefully there will be one soon. Hopefully the, the, the convention of a couple of years ago to settle the uh, Caspian demarcation disputes will help reduce the ability of countries to oppose these pipelines. Uh, the most logical way to move gas in Western Turkmenistan to markets is westward. Uh, the Dostluk field, uh, which was uh, a, a bone of contention for decades between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. It's an oil field that used to be called Idir Kapaz or Sardar in the middle of the Caspian Sea uh, that, that Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan argued over as to who, who owned it. Um, th that now uh, dispute has been resolved, but there's no movement on reaching an agreement between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan on how to develop it together. They've agreed they're going to develop the field together, but there's been absolutely no progress in negotiations for a year and a half. And I think that's largely due to the political transition in Turkmenistan. As we know, there's just been, just like in Pakistan, there was the transition uh, that, that Shams was, des was describing in Turkmenistan as well, uh, from, from uh, one Berdi Muhammadov to, to, to another. Uh, and I think it's going to take a while before um, that transition uh, consolidates and before the new leadership of Turkmenistan uh, gets gets its sea legs, as we say in conventional uh, English, American colloquial English, and, and can start to think strategically. Um, so in the meantime, it strikes me that the way to get more Turkmenistani gas moving toward Europe is to do more of what's already happening. What's already happening is Turkmenistani gas moving to Iran and then Iranian gas moving into Azerbaijan and then into Turkey. That's all already happening. There was an agreement signed last, uh, I guess it was October, between the leaders of Turkmenistan, Iran, and Azerbaijan to do more of what I just said. So there, there are limited volumes moving, a couple of BCM moving in the way I described, the swap where gas goes from Turkmenistan to Iran. It's consumed in northern Iran, where Tehran and uh, Tabriz are. And then using a different pipeline network, gas from southern Iran moves into Azerbaijan and Turkey. Great. In the past, the U.S. has opposed that. Now the Biden administration doesn't oppose that. There needs to be a, a bit more investment to expand the capacity of the interconnections, but that's doable. So hopefully we'll see more natural gas moving along that transit route. And then there's enormous capacity for other types of transit. Uh, there's my dog, sorry. <laughs> so uh, container shipping. Uh, that Murad, you've been such a, a pioneer, an innovator in developing, and it's possible perhaps to move some natural gas in other ways uh, across the Caspian Sea, maybe liquid natural gas, maybe compressed natural gas, but it's going to take a while for those options to attract investment and to develop. So in the short term, Europe needs to move urgently, I think, to get that gas from Turkmenistan and more from Azerbaijan if possible. But container shipping in, in two directions uh, is something, again, you've been developing so innovatively uh, uh, Murad. Uh, data transit. I mean, there's there's a massive project that I've been involved with to connect the data centers of East uh, of Southeast Europe with Central Asia underneath the Black Sea and across uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan and under the Caspian Sea. Uh, that project has run into some opposition in Georgia, uh, political opposition with the government, I think, wanting to, to nationalize some of those assets. Uh, but the, the, the promise of this project is enormous as a way to deliver high speed, low cost Internet connectivity to people who've never had it, extending all the way into Afghanistan. So the possibilities are out there. Uh, to me, the good news is the U.S. Uh, is, is now awake uh, under the Biden administration, wants to be decisive and offer assistance. Uh, and uh, now I think is going to react in Central Asia 
like it did, uh, although in a quiet way, not enough, after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, which is to try to uh, limit Russia's ability to uh, duplicate its aggression as it's shown in Ukraine and Georgia now in Central Asia. So my last point is, um, and as you and I have discussed, Murat, there are signs that President Putin is beginning to flex his muscles uh, in, in, in uh, Uzbekistan, in Turkmenistan, uh, but he's limited in what he can do, as we saw in Kazakhstan. So in Kazakhstan, when we had the, the, the violent events and the protests a couple of months ago, uh, President Tokayev reached out to President Putin and said, please send troops with the Collective Security Treaty Organization to quell this unrest. President Putin agreed for 10 days, for only 10 days. Uh, that showed to me that Russia is really focused and overburdened in Ukraine. So there's a limit to how much uh, Russia is going to uh, be able to uh, withhold or hold back countries like Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan from trying to implement uh, aggressive reform uh, programs. And we saw President Tokayev here in, in Ankara just last week, which was a powerful signal, I think, to the region and to Moscow that uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan is going to pursue its own path of development and Turkey and the East-West Corridor is going to be uh, playing a big role. So there are huge opportunities now in a moment of tremendous geopolitical flux in the region. And I think a lot of those changes are about to be uh, unlocked and we'll see a big increase in the transit of natural gas, of container, containerized cargo and data uh, from the greater Caspian region to Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the great speech. And uh, I think uh, even for me, there was a lot of new information, although uh, <laughs> I'm in the region and we have regular discussions. Uh, and uh, but uh, important thing that uh, with the existing situation in the world, uh, transit corridors, especially for the energy corridors uh, from the greatest Caspian region, became really extremely important for the world and uh, of course for Europe. And uh, uh, there is a big potential for development. Uh, some projects are uh, placed on hold, let's say like this, although agreements were reached, uh, but we hope all these projects will fly and will be materialized in a very short time. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Stephen Becher uh, to discuss a completely different topic, but uh, the same important for the, for the Central Asia and for the whole region. It's a water security. And uh, uh, Stefan, uh, he's the CEO of International Water Security Foundation. Uh, he had uh, more than a decade of experience in the Central Asia. He was advisor to the president of Kyrgyzstan, and he's a great specialist in the water security. And uh, we saw during the last year uh, several conflicts. Uh, even uh, it was a military conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan for water. Uh, we see also lack of water in the Mudaria River, uh, which could bring in other tensions between uh, other countries. And uh, I would like uh, Stefan to, to give his ideas uh, and proposals for the governments of the Central Asia, of, of the countries of the Central Asia, how to avoid such conflicts, or if such conflicts already starting, how to solve them at the earliest possible stage to prevent any uh, escalation. Please, uh, Stefan. Oh. Okay. I think Stefan got problem with the connection. Okay, we will wait a uh, couple of minutes for him. Uh, meanwhile, I would like uh, to ask uh, Sham and Matthew just uh, three or at least two main recommendations uh, for the region, for the government, for the people in the region, uh, how to unlock uh, greater Caspian region potential in this difficult, turbulent world. Please, let's start from Sham. Uh, okay. Please unmute your microphone. Oh, yes, perfect. It's okay now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, now, now it's okay. With this new technology, you know, it's, you never know where, what happens, how it happens, you know, so until we find out. Very good question, uh, Murat. I think it's about time that, as I was working all these years, in, in basically in Afghanistan or outside, the regional cooperation issue. 
uh, regional cooperation doesn't mean only for Afghanistan, but re- in, in a much larger level and so on. Somebody has to take lead uh, a country. Uh, earlier days, we were very much looking forward to, uh, in matter of fact, I, I do recall in the meeting, uh, President Karzai and uh, Nazarbayev, we raised this question with him. So you take the lead on a number of issues and then bring everybody together on the table. You can afford it financially and otherwise the location wise and so on. So take the lead in that. I think there's still, I still believe there's some need, some need to, to, to a country or a institution should lead bringing together the whole region once again. And ask this, this question is what we, how we should go about it. That is one thing I think we should continue to, to regional cooperation, regional initiative, regional exchanges, you call it. This is, this can help quite a bit, uh, the whole region and for individual countries as well. So that's number one thing I, I, I recommend, and I would hope somebody will do that. Perhaps Murat, your institution can do that. You can start some something like that, for example. Uh, yeah, we can Murat, initiate such discussions also, yes. Actually, yeah, we're already doing this. Uh, exactly, bravo, yeah. bravo. The other things I want to see is, I like to see something movement on the Iran side. Um, although things are moving now a little bit uh, echoing, but I think Iran is a, is, a, is, a, is a country which has can play a very significant role in it, and it has to be brought back to the to the table, and then uh, sort of you know ask them to take the lead in this area and that area and so on. That is another area which I think we should really b- b- focus on on, on 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 that count. Then of course the the, the cross border exchanges must continue. Uh, as as much as possible, and ver- ver- variety of issues. This is I'll start with that, and then we'll build up on that. Uh, thank you, Sham. And now I would like switch to Stefan, who suddenly disappeared uh, from and our screen. <laughs> yeah, it's again the technology of twenty first century. <laughs> Very difficult to handle. I know. Uh, okay, uh, I just uh, already introduced you, Stefan, for the audience, and uh, w- would like to hear your views on the situation with the water security in the Central Asia, particularly, and how to avoid conflicts uh, related to, uh, to to the water in the region, like we saw the recent conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and some other potential sleeping co- conflicts uh, because of a lack of water. Please, Stefan. Okay. I mean, first of all, I'd also like to touch upon uh, Kyrgyzstan as a, a logistics hub uh, between Asia and Europe uh, before we get into that, because it's a project that under Ottenbaev was started and that we were working with World Bank and uh, UNIDO, the United Nations uh, Industrial Development Organization, on creating a logistics hub for the region. And I and the, we look at Kyrgyzstan as being at the crossroads of four and a half billion people within a five-hour uh, radius, uh, you know, air flight uh, radius. So the connectivity for the region is very significant. Um, in relation to water security, that uh, fortunately Kyrgyzstan is a very water-rich country, but uh, throughout the region there are challenges. Uh, this goes back to um, I spent time in Uzbekistan and the challenges with the Aral Sea, and uh, you know at one point where Kazakhstan made a decision, you know, to uh, basically divide the northern half of the, or the northern third of the Aral Sea to replenish and to restock the uh, fishing um, and create the livelihood for their area. Um, It created challenges for Uzbekistan because for Uzbekistan, of course, this impacts their cotton industry, which is their third largest cotton producer in the world. Um, And a lot of these cross-border disputes are being managed now through different organizations such as uh, SHAS, the Shanghai or, uh, Cooperation Organization, mm-hmm. through the Turkic Council, that they're serving as mediators to try to overcome these. Um, I think that as you as time progresses, that you're going to see 
a larger uh, number of disputes arising because of the fact that who has the the uh, rights for the water, um, especially with the flows of the rivers, and uh, who will be a, basically controlling what flows downstream. Uh, hydroelectric also is playing a, a role into this. Um, Kyrgyzstan, as it develops hydroelectric power and tries to become a, a regional uh, electric exporter, net exporter of electricity, there they have also started to impact uh, some of the regional countries, as you've uh, touched upon, upon what's happened with Tajikistan. So this is going to play a greater significance in the regional cooperation as well. So in the longer run, it, you, you know, there's going to have to be uh, renegotiated agreements on water. And I think that when, when we look at what the future holds as far as um, the changing of uh, climate, the climate change, and what impact that is holding on the region. I think that we're going to have Okay. Uh, Stefan is based in DC, and uh, I think now it's around 2 a.m. there. Uh, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Not so easy to keep connection, but this was the only way to combine speakers from uh, the whole world. Like <laughs> that's why for Europe is very early morning uh, in uh, Washington DC is a very late night. But okay, hope he, he will come back again uh, to the session. Uh, Matthew, uh, from your side, please uh, two, three main idea, highlighting ideas. Uh, how to improve uh, the situation in the Greater Caspian region, how to unlock the region's potential. Sure. Yes. One, one broad strategic concept, I think, goes back to Turkey. You know, in the last few months, uh, the government of President Erdogan has articulated a, a desire to play some sort of a facilitative and stabilizing role uh, among the Turkic states, as they call them. So the, they've, they've transformed the old organization. They've given it a new name to the Organization of Turkic States. I think it used to be the Organization of, or the Council of Turkish States. In any case, this is a sign that uh, Turkish foreign policy is returning to uh, a, an active, a more active role in the greater Caspian region, really among the Turkic states of Central Asia. Uh, Turkey tried this, as you'll remember, Murat, uh, back in the late 90s, uh, when there was a flood of Turkish business businessmen coming to Central Asia looking, frankly, to get rich quickly and uh, often not uh, behaving in the most uh, collaborative or respectful way. I mean, I was I was kind of appalled in meetings I was in when the way I, I saw the, the people from Turkey kind of relating to the people of, uh, of Central Asia. I think I think the Turkish government learned a lesson and learn to be uh, much more respectful to the people, the Turkic peoples in Central Asia. <clears throat> and they've had a couple of decades now of business ties being developed. Uh, and so I think uh, with that Turkish geopolitical, geoeconomic ambition of, of bringing the Central Asian states, or the Turkic states, all closer together uh, to do things that help stabilize the world, I think that's an opportunity for Turkey to play that convening role that Sean was talking about. And by the way, it may sound naive when I say, you know, Turkey wants to play the stabilizing role, but uh, this truly is how this current Turkish government views Turkey's role in the world. It truly views Turkey as being a stabilizing factor. Uh, and it uses Ukraine as an example thereof. So Turkey has provided quite decisive uh, military assistance to Ukraine in the form of the uh, Bayraktar TB2 drones, which have really played a big role, just as they did on the battlefield in Idlib in stopping Russia's uh, advance on civilians in Idlib, and in also stopping the Wagner mercenaries uh, in Libya, uh, and also it, uh, helping Azerbaijan basically neutralize advanced Russian military equipment on the ground uh, during the war to, uh, against Armenia, the Second Karabakh War, in the autumn of 2020. Uh, 2020 sorry. And so Turkey thinks what it's doing with Ukraine is helping play the stabilizing role, resisting Russia's invasion, supporting Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty and aspirations to join NATO, but also uh, being available as a mediator, one that President Putin respects. I think President Putin has come to respect Turkey's tough line 
but but its own respectful approach toward Russia and Putin himself. So you don't hear President Erdogan calling President Putin names like killer, uh, murderer, uh, war criminal. But instead, Turkey is left open the channel for itself to play a mediating role. And I think there was some real progress uh, a month or so ago uh, when uh, Turkey t- uh, helped to persuade uh, Ukraine uh, to say, OK, we could, if there's a ceasefire and Russia removes its troops from, from Ukraine, we'll be neutral. We won't join NATO. Uh, and we can uh, talk about the f- legal status of Donetsk and Crimea sometime in the future, 15 years. That was a near breakthrough that President Putin didn't want to accept, but it's still on the table. So similarly, Turkey can play a sort of calming and stabilizing role uh, in the greater Caspian region. And then Turkish uh, investors can help provide the capital to make these projects we've alluded to happen. Mm. A second idea Uh, that's related could be uh, to create a string of uh, organized industrial zones stretching from the east side of the Caspian to the west side and onward across the Caucasus into Turkey. Uh, So these could be organized industrial zones that take advantage of, let's say, uh, the presence of low-cost natural gas, uh, which, okay, for now is going to go to Europe, but uh, hopefully, but much will remain, most of it will remain in the Great Caspian region, region. Uh, to develop value-added industries, so to develop uh, to develop petrochemicals, which then can become uh, plastics, which then can become inputs into, let's say, into the textile business in eastern Turkey. So there, you know, there's there's, there's some proposals out there to develop an organized industrial zone in the Kazakhstani port of Kurik, uh, which is an alternative uh, and a complement uh, to Aktau. Uh, and then do the same in uh, Elat, so the relatively new port in Azerbaijan, and then create some similar organized industrial zones in what Azerbaijan calls the recovered lands of Karabakh, and then uh, in eastern Turkey as well, where there's textile production. But to me, the most important piece would be an organized industrial zone uh, simultaneously on the territory of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Turkey. Uh, which is possible in the northwest corner of Azerbaijan's uh, region of Nakhchivan, uh, which is not physically contiguous with the rest of Azerbaijan. It's separated by Armenia. Uh, but there is there is a, a, a part of it where the, the borders of Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan converge. Uh, there are uh, Armenian towns and cities nearby that desperately need jobs, economic development, investment, uh, and there have been preliminary discussions about bringing this idea together. However, Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey need to normalize their relations with Armenia, and that's going to involve a peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan and uh, demarcation of borders between Armenia and Turkey and Armenia and Azerbaijan. But as a vision for the near-term future, I, th- I think uh, this could attract a lot of investment if the governments create these organized industrial zones, which means... They provide investment incentives, not necessarily cash, uh, but in kind. So uh, natural gas, electricity, utility hookup, uh, roads that are needed to, for the actual construction, access to the ports uh, and to the, the future factories. And all that would need to be coordinated. The private sector will have to play the, 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 the dynamic investment role. But yes, we need a convener, as Sham was saying, uh, and maybe Turkey through this uh, well, maybe not through the organization of Turkic states, since that won't make Armenia so comfortable, but use Turkey's geopolitical vision uh, to be a stabilizing and, and facilitative player in the region uh, could begin to help organize uh, all, all the various actors that would be needed to bring this together. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, th- th- thank you for the great ideas. Uh, I like this uh, industrial zone net- no- zones network uh, in the greater Caspian region because uh, they are already existing in the various countries, but like randomly and uh, not systematically. And uh, uh, if uh, it will be possible to uh, create some kind of network of these industrial zones covering the whole region, it will really, could really boost the economic development of the region and also the transit uh, in our, uh, and also through the region. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, Sha, Matthew, and uh, Stefan, who again disappeared because of it looks <laughs> like a problem with internet connections. But uh, we got the main ideas from Stefan about the water security. Uh, and uh, I will just like to conclude while we still have a couple of minutes, although already 15 minutes uh, behind the schedule. Uh, and uh, today, more than ever, uh, we need peace and stability in the world. 
and we need peace of stability.